It's uh, again a delight to see so many people in this room for the Dean's Innovation Series. Uh, I recognize some uh, folks who've been coming to almost every event, and I, I see some uh, new visitors who've come from as far away as uh, the Northern <coughs> Corner, South Africa. Uh, Ian has come here. We're delighted to see him. Uh, Kevin McCarty's come in from Washington, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to see folks who've also come from across town as well as across campus and, of course, in of our building. Um, the, the purpose of this Dean's Innovation Series is to provide an opportunity for uh, people to explain and engage in dialogue about innovation in, in news and media and, and communications and public relations. Uh, the theme that we've been trying to uh, advance in this is you either innovate or you die. Uh, that's the strong version of it. You innovate or you become less relevant. You innovate or you miss uh, tremendous opportunities. And so here at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, we have been taking the innovation theme very uh, seriously. Uh, we've had a number of presentations uh, this year by our faculty. We had a very interesting talk on the Metamorphosis and Intersections project that many of you in the room are familiar with. It's based here in local communities, being very innovative with local communities using new technologies. Uh, we've talked about culture and creativity, uh, popular music. Uh, the last presentation was on brand culture, uh, not just in a narrow sense of how you sell uh, eyeglasses, but how many of us are taking on um, branding, self-branding, as a way to advance our own ideas, both in the commercial sphere, but also in the personal sphere. Um, and today, uh, we have a, uh, we're, we're taking this in, uh, in yet another direction uh, to talk about uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism has been wrestling with what does it mean to be able to produce a group of people uh, year after year who are innovative. And we've identified a number of competencies, leadership, innovation, entrepreneurship, service, et cetera, that we think all, uh, all citizens and certainly all people in, in the journalism and communications business must have. Uh, and this is yet another uh, very exciting example of, of innovation. Uh, I had the, uh, the, the privilege of uh, joining Tom Amalia um, and his group last week, and there was a group of students from engineering and the business school and journalism who were in the room together working across these different schools inventing the future. You could literally see the future being constructed right in front of your very eyes. Uh, the boot camp that uh, Vicki Porter has been uh, developing uh, over the over the years, really, uh, and working with Tom and to do that uh, has, is another example. And so, what I would like to do, uh, Vicky, by the way, is, is just a uh, a dynamo, um, a real innovator, has been working in this area so shy. of Portland School. <laughs> um, she heads the um, Knight Digital Media Center, brings <coughs> in people from all across the country to talk about sort of news.com. What does that mean in this new era? Um, she shared a 1986 Pulitzer Prize gold medal as part of a five-person team while city editor at the Denver Post. So she has a legacy media chops as well as digital media chops um, and is enormously uh, innovative. Um, also participating will be Tom O'Malia, who has spent his entire uh, career, really, in entrepreneurial ventures and teaching, including over 20 years uh, here at uh, USC. And it is a, a special pleasure to, to welcome Tom, because entrepreneurship has to be done and innovation has to be done at the, at the margins, not just at the center, and that in includes schools. So we're especially pleased that, um, that Tom is here representing uh, the Marshall School and the good work that they're doing. Um, and we've entered, I think, into a very productive collaboration between Marshall and, um, and the Annenberg School, which we look forward to continuing. I know that Vicki has to catch an airplane to go flying off to yet some other interesting event. And so, Vicki, you're going to go first, and um, I invite you to uh, 
lead us into the world of innovation. And if you, if, the one thing we would ask, and we've asked each, what would you have done differently as an innovator? Is there something that you would have done differently that you've learned now that you didn't know? Before? That actually, Dean Wilson, that's, that's an excellent question, and I really appreciate it because, um, hi everybody. <laughs> Uh, I'm one, and tremendously intimidated. I'm glad I do have some friendly faces there. But the, uh, Dean's Forum is just, you know, outside of my pay grade. And so I'm, I'm really, uh, but I'm excited to share what we've been up to in the last uh, year and a half, especially with my partner, uh, Tom O'Malia, who um, also, uh, I don't even know if the Dean knows this, is, is, was named one of the 12 best uh, entrepreneurial professors in the United States by Fortune magazine. So I, I, I describe my job as being very simple. I try to aggregate small, smart people. I'm an aggregator. I bring smart people together with smart people and let them do their thing. And Tom's one of the smartest. So, And at this point, before I also, I, I see uh, my colleague Sasha over there, oh, and I wouldn't be I wouldn't be uh, in, in partnership with Tom if it wasn't for Sasha bringing us together. She bugged me for weeks. <laughs> so um, I'm really pitching the ball, and I'm going to let Tom knock it out of the, the park. And I used a sports analogy, which I never do, so you can tell how I nervous I am. Yes. Um, we call this the mashup of journalism with entrepreneurship because that's exactly what it is. It's taking two very separate disciplines that while I was a practicing journalist, and it wasn't that long ago <laughs> I was, uh, we never, those, those two folk didn't get in a room together. I mean, it just wasn't part of the chemistry. Um, and I also want to quickly give context to what I'm going to talk about. Um, and you all know this, so I'm not going to dwell on it. State of uh, the news media, 2010. They said it in tw 2009. Um, the, the world as I know it and the world as traditional legacy media have known has been imploding for at least the last five to ten years. We know that. I mean, the job losses, I, I spent too much time trying to figure out how many losses have we had. The numbers vary too much, thousands and thousands. Some say 41%. Of, uh, no, 40, that's the revenues, but 41% of revenues is gone, but maybe at one third of the newsroom jobs may be gone as of what's happened in the last few years. And the same has happened in broadcast. My, the fantastic folks at Annenberg who are involved in broadcast know that more than anybody else. Uh, the work we do can't always go back to the same old legacy places that existed before. So this is, this is kind of the environment in which. Um, bring this around here, the Knight Digital Media Center decided to place itself, to really do something. We, this is the advertisement. Uh, the Knight Digital Media Center, created by the Knight Foundation in 2006, to basically, our mission is very simple, very easy, uh, speed the transformation of the news biz into the digital age. Uh, that's my deliverable. So you can see why I had to find people like Tom. When we sat back wondering last a couple of year and a half ago, what should we be doing other than just bringing journalists in to talk about how to cover topics in the cyberspace, how to uh, restructure your newsroom and, and to take advantage of the digital age, we came up with the fact that there are all these journalists who are very, very smart, who don't have jobs anymore. What could we do for them that would also do for their communities, taking advantage of that smarts, and frankly, creating, and we, this sounds grandiose in many ways, but helping to create this new news ecology, this new web of, of entrepreneurism and, uh, and journalism startups. Um, that basically was kind of the, the, the little C that I started wondering about how, and how could we do it was, um, um, Again, this is an opportunity under, in the entrepreneurial mindset. From Tom's point of view, it's a pain. And it, quite frankly, is obviously a pain when you have a lot of really smart people out, at, out on the streets. So this is the pain we saw uh, a year and a half ago. There was a lot of smart, trained, professional journalists out there. They were without work. Uh, the open source self-publishing tools that were available made it possible for people to 
to really have a voice without having a lot of money and uh, um, without having necessarily a lot of uh, physical plant to worry about as news organizations do. The opportunity, the fragmentation of coverage of local and niched information meant that there were a lot of places for specialization that journalists who had that specialty knowledge could probably find a voice in a place. And the opportunity, again, which goes right to my idea of the boot camp, and that is what I call the right brain, left brain collision. The entrepreneur side of the brain colliding with the journalist side of the brain. When we started chatting, it was informally. We started chatting here at Annenberg first. Geneva was just coming on board, and we were talk starting the discussions. Uh, Sasha, uh, we would have little brainstorming chats, and she brought up this guy's name. And somehow, some way, we have got on his busy schedule, which is really very hard to get on, and had uh, a beginning lunch. And since then, uh, I can't tell you how generous he's been in, in what we've been able to do. As you know, the Online Journalism Review is published out of the Knight Digital Media Center, and Robert Niles, as the, what I call the chief wrangler of the OJR, is also an entrepreneur, a news entrepreneur, who has a couple of actually very, very successful sites that he does in addition to the post he does for um, uh, OJR. And the Center for Communication Leadership and Policy at uh, Annenberg, uh, we were able to call on their expertise to help in some of our organizations. So, and David Westfall at the time, who was a very important voice because he was doing research on these organizations uh, that were the startups, the new startups that were starting to happen. Um, one of the things that I think is really relevant to this conversation that uh, we have had to deal with as we brought people into the room, uh, and I, I apologize for, for just basically being fairly flip. Uh, I believe in the profession. But the traditional journalist mindset, I truly believe, has, has a fairly um, hired principled sense of itself in many ways that doesn't fit the new age. And uh, one, I always believed that I was on a mission for greater good. I was on a mission from God. I was a journalist. I was going to right the wrongs. I had independence of thought. Nobody above me, nobody in advertising, nobody who I was writing for was going to really influence what I was looking for, the greater truth. The story was the ultimate road to that greater good. It was all about the story. Once I wrote the story, once we wrote the story, once we shot the, the story, um, the great unwashed, the masses, would rise up and, and make everything better. And we had this wall. We actually had several walls, by the way. We had this wall, and I've just described, we had the wall between revenue, where the revenue came from. And we didn't even call it revenue. We just didn't want to know where the dollars came from. And we also had this, this wall between our editorial page, between our publisher, with our readers, with our viewers, so that we were totally left to, to do the greater good. That kind of mindset has been totally undone by the digital factor, as we all know. And I'm, the unbundling of news and information, as I've said, there's, there's a whole new um, competitive force out there. You can't just keep it all to yourself. The interaction and interchange of the producer and the consumer. I worked in an era when it was all pushed out. There was no conversation, no two-way. It is now all two-way. The democratization of the tools. As I said, everybody can be a publisher. We know this. I'm not telling you anything new. And the story never ends, which I think doesn't get talked about enough in the new digital ecology or era that we're talking about. What I love about what's going on right now is you just don't publish and walk away. The story continues and, and continues to get legs from both the readers who were, absor who were participating in that and who become creators based on what they know. That, to me, is one of the most beautiful aspects of the, the new changes. And we have an opportunity, because of the economics of digital, to fail. And as another uh, entrepreneurial lesson, to fail intelligently. And one of the mindsets of my traditional journalist past, it had to be perfect. 
It had to be perfect. How many times have you written a story that went through five editors? How many times have you redone a section, introduced a new product, and it took six months to do the prototype? This is being done now in days, months, weeks, and then it, if it's broken, it gets fixed or it gets, it gets booted. That's the beauty of where we are, the beauty of the opportunity. News Entrepreneur Boot Camp that we have done was uh, literally almost a year ago in May. Uh, we brought in uh, 16 people out of a competitive pool of more than 100. And all we did was ask, if you're a smart person and you've got a great idea for a community news and information site and a public interest, pitch it to us. Tell us. And from that group, we would pick 16 people to come for, and expenses paid, the equivalent of $5,000 each in boot camp training and how to make this happen. And my operative is, I was looking for smart journalists knowing that most of them didn't know a damn thing about business. That's what this is all about, business and entrepreneurship. That changing that mindset, people, we had some very good people who did not get in the room because they already had it. They, you could see that they thought like entrepreneurs. I didn't need to help them. Tom didn't need to help them. I'm, he's, he's the aggregate. Um, one of the things that we have done in the boot camp, and again, going to what the, the dean asked, what have we learned and what are next, as we go forward this year, uh, in uh, May 16th, we'll have our next boot camp. This time it's 20 people. And this time we're, we're sharpening what we want them to take away, much more, much more. And we're sharpening what we, what we require of them to do. They're having to do much more. One of the things, again, because of Tom, our, our 20 boot campers this year are participating in a online course that Tom has developed for Marshall School of Business in entrepreneurism. So it is a course, he, we're beta testing it, in which they are spending asynchronous time online between now and May 12th, uh, frankly learning uh, what Tom's secrets are on how to think differently before they even get to our classroom. That's going to put us further ahead in being able to work with them clo more closely. Um, we also now are following, are going to follow them more closely and learn from their successes and more importantly their failures. That is something we learned last year. Uh, and through that process we will also be providing them with monthly check-ins. Monthly, ex we'll bring experts back to them if they're an area. Once they leave, they, they tell us, well, I wished you'd done this. Because they realized after that week that they needed to know this now. And we've only got a week. We don't have an MBA program yet. Um, that will be part of what we hope to do going forward. And we also hope that we'll be doing two of these a year at least, uh, so that we can put many more people through. Um, these are, and if I could have my able assistant very quickly, I just wanted to really quickly, before I pass the ball to uh, Tom, to introduce you to what's a, just a samples of the work done by our, our uh, fellows from last year. This is Wendy Norris, who went back to Colorado and created Western Citizen. This is, an, uh, again, a nonprofit model in which she is trying to, to, to basically motivate a citizen journalism movement as well as a trained journalism collaboration to go after specific issues involving Western United States, uh, the Rocky Mountain West. This is Investigate West. Um, you remember the Seattle PI closed, now is only an online only newspaper. Rita Hibbard was the managing editor for investigations. Uh, they happened to close the PI as we were launching. I invited them to send us somebody because they were saying they were going to start an online operation. Rita took us up. Um, she was incredibly, incredibly smart, but scared to death. Scared to death because she was going into a, a world of, of finance and a world of uh, trying to, to do stuff that she'd not been trained for. I am now on their board, and um, they've gotten at least three grants. They've published with partnerships. And they're going to be, uh, they're part of the larger uh, investigative news network. Uh, Michael, 
McCartney, I keep getting him, was uh, uh, another of our alum went back and developed Seattle Local Health Online. And our star, can we go to our star? Yes. Bargain Babe. Okay. <laughs> Almost every one of the, uh, those I showed you, okay, they were a uh, nonprofit, very serious news. Bargain Babe is, is like the ultimate model. She's my poster child because she does good work in both making money, creating a market for herself, self-promotion, but it, sounds, it doesn't sound like serious journalism. This woman does consumer journalism that we needed to have long ago. And I'm just going to show you really quick. She has been on Good Morning America. She has been on NBC. She has developed her own film clip, for, for those of you, in which she's being interviewed by a journalist on, on what BargainBabe.com is all about. It's like a, a broadcast student doing a, you know, their own role. Um, I, we probably don't have time, so I'm just going to move ahead. That basically is what we're about. And it, it's, it, like I said, my, the beauty of my job is I've been able to bring those people together with people like Tom, Robert Niles, who is just an excellent, he does it, knows how to do it. And other guests, folks, these folks will be in the room next time, next month helping. And with that, I'm, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. It was mentioned earlier, but. I'm just going to croak at you for a minute. I won't do it long. <coughs> Vicki mentioned that we were expanding on the boot camp this year. Ernie mentioned that he got to go into this room last week with uh, Tom. We, I have to tell you that for a director, sometimes people come to you and make your dreams come true in ways you weren't even sure they could be realized. Some of you know that I've been trying for a couple of years now to get uh, a, a grouping of Marshall, Viterbi, and Annenberg students together to work on being entrepreneurial about journalism in the technical world. And we are doing that. Dana Chen is leading it this summer. We are beginning May 16th, right after graduation. We have 12 students from Annenberg, Marshall, and Viterbi. Three teams. They are working with the uh, LA Times, the Orange County Register, and KPCC to uh, be entrepreneurial and, and take journalism on uh, mobile technologies. They'll have iPads, they'll have uh, iPhones, they'll have not so intelligent phones that are used by more people. And uh, um, this would not be possible without a grant from the Spencer family, but also without Vicki's and Tom's inclusion of this group in their KDMC boot camp for a week. Um, I know nobody more innovation-minded than Vicki Moore, more entrepreneurial than Tom, and they're really making this dream come true. So many entrepreneurial things happening in the school. Some of you were here yesterday for Stroom's birth in this very room, this video collaborative tool. Just a really exciting time, and I'm very grateful to these two who are driving it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And as I said, I, I really want to turn this over to Tom, and I apologize for having to, to, to leave, but I'm actually going to be on a, going to a roundtable of nonprofit news sites in which sustainability is going to be, and innovation is going to be the main topic of discussion. Um, but it also is very important, and I don't want to leave. I never believed we'd have, I thought we'd be successful if we got traction out of one of the 16. That's really important for me to say. This is not a magic bullet. It's not a silver bullet. If one of them, like Bargain Babe, <laughs> so I, I can count maybe three out of this, but that's the key. They're, the other folks, they're, they, they're not, you know, they're still, they're still working at it, but there's, not, there's no traction. And so this isn't the solution to the layoff of tens of thousands of journalists, and the, it is a part of the, the, next, the next generation. And with that, Tom? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I hate to lecture. I hated it when I was a student. I hated it as a teacher. I'm a conversationalist. You have the remote. What you get out of this whole thing is what happens when you put your hand up in the air. If you got the question, we can talk about it. Otherwise, I'll mail you the slides and we can go have lunch someday. <laughs> I'm serious. So make this, make this what you want out of it by using it the way that it should be. Uh, I'm Tom. I'm a recovering entrepreneur. <laughs> That's good. The last time I did that, I got about 12 high Toms back. <laughs> so, your faculty's sober. Everything else is up for grabs, but. Uh, 
Um, I wanted to tell you just a little bit about us. We are, by most definitions, the oldest entrepreneur program in the country. There were actually classes in the middle 60s uh, where students were being trained to be able to acquire companies and start companies using uh, Trojan bucks uh, as, a, as a means of, of exchange. Uh, we're extremely well known for our uh, alumni. I'm just showing three of them up there. Uh, Mark Benioff started the little company called Salesforce.com, the largest IPO offering in the last decade. Uh, MySpace came out of a feasibility class, and uh, not a bad little start. Kinko's was one of the first of the superstars. We're also known for bringing in people and sharing materials, and one of those that I'm going to leave with you, Ernie, is I think one of the stories that a journalist should have written as opposed to an entrepreneur, the story of Richard Rosenblatt and the creation of demand media. He just announced yesterday that he has made a deal with Goldman Sachs to be able to uh, uh, put together an IPO for that. And I wish I had some friends that can get stock, and so do you, but it's not going to happen because it's now public. Uh, just one quick footnote. Uh, this fellow, Richard Bl Rosenblatt, it will be our uh, graduation speaker You're at the communication school. Oh. Partially because of Jim Ellis's intervention saying there's this really cool guy, you should go talk right. to him. I think so. You're gonna, you're gonna you're gonna learn an awful lot. Uh, we do a thing called the Entrepreneur of the Year. Uh, we do people uh, like Starbucks and JD Powers. Amgen was started on an intelligent failure by George Rathman. Uh, so he's got he's got some stories and a journey that are absolutely incredible. So uh, that's what we're about. What we know is is how to stay. Uh, I've outranked Pete Carroll for seven of the last ten years. He's only been here for seven, so we're probably tied. <laughs> but that's showing I'm a real entrepreneur. So I, uh, I, when, when we start talking about entrepreneurship, we can talk for hours and hours and hours. Uh, the one topic I want to get to is this part that scares people. What's the mindset? What allows some people to go do things that some may consider to be risky that I think are risk management opportunities? And so I'm going to go with this, and please, get, your, get your, your full feel out of this. Why is it important today, and why is it important to you? Why does this word entrepreneurship, which comes from the basement of the Greif Center inside of the Marshall School, why would you even care about it? <coughs> Maybe you don't care about it. Is this a... Uh, they just a, came for the food. They came for the food. No, they're not used to having faculty that pick on them. So, <laughs> Sasha, why is this important to you? Oh, so it's completely important. For right now, um, I'm thinking about all my students who, uh, who are about to graduate who are freaking out. And when I had them in the fall, they didn't understand why we were doing the lessons we were doing in, in the class with you and with Robert. Some of them were still e emailing. Yeah. And they were, uh, frankly, a little resistant to it. And sort of, what does this have to do with me? And, uh, uh, and I kept saying, hold on, get through it. You're going to understand. And now they're at my doorstep <laughs> saying, what was that all about again? Because I really need to know it. So um, it's just so important that it, within the school that these students uh, feel totally excited about getting out there on their yeah. own. Yeah. This is the language of the next 20 years. It has been the language for the last 20 years, if you think back about it. Uh, why? Because the world has changed. That's why it's important. How has it changed? We have moved away from innovation uh, too much innovation, not optimization, which was always the model of commerce. And we don't do it by perfecting the known, but having the courage to imperfectly go after the unknown with a control inside of our mind that says, I'm not afraid to make a mistake as long as it's not fatal. Intelligent failures are part of the road to, to growing. So the world has changed, and it's not going to change back. We see it everywhere. Uh, an advertisement in the, in the London Times, a conservative newspaper talking about I, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead of one. This is Bill Gate or uh, Bill Ford telling the world that uh, his model no longer works. That's four years ago, five years ago. He didn't know it then? I'm not sure. They're doing a good job back, but the business models that have sustained us for decades are no longer sufficient to do that. And there is no industry that is more recognizing of that than your industry right now. Anything that's inside of either journalism, communication, does not matter. The world has changed. I think the world is changing for the model of the university, too, but uh, it's just uh, an, an issue that I have. <laughs> We're seeing tremendous changes in the infrastructure. 
a whole education that was carried on by the pharmacies no longer exists because they no longer do the old way of they doing it, of doing education by salespeople storming doctors' offices. It's too expensive of a model. We're into a new world, new things. We see then a whole different need to think. And of all the phrases of entrepreneurship, the one I hate the most is outside the box. <laughs> it, it, it just it doesn't describe the way we think, but just to get it out of your system, here's your challenge. Every undergrad I know can do this in a second. How do I connect those nine dots without picking up the pencil or over tracing? There, I like people that do that. I'm going this, I'm going, I like that. So it's an illustration for a very simple thing. If you want to do this, you got to go outside the box twice. So it's not just getting outside the box. You're going to have to dig deeper and harder to be able to, uh, to do that. One more thing to get out of the way before we get into some things is that a lot of time when asked to speak somewhere, I really bring up and get further ahead when I start talking about entrepreneurship as a riddle. And I have my 10 riddles of entrepreneurship. But the first one is, what is the difference between an enterprising innovative manager, which Marshall produces an awful lot of business managers, and that of an entrepreneur? What's the difference between a gifted journalist and what might be someday called an entrepreneurial journalist? And why are they different? How are they different? If I understand the rules of that engagement, I'm going to be ahead of the pack because we know that there's going to be more of these in the long run than there are going to be multiple people, even people that are doing contract work or people that are, are on contract to do something else. People are responsible for themselves. So what would be, back to the first one, the difference between the mind of some of the most clever business people in the world and that of an entrepreneur, usually thought about as uh, the garage and two kids and a little thing called a computer and creating Apple. That's what people think about. I never bought the garage. Uh, the den was good enough for me to start my companies. Didn't have to go out and do that. So, but how are the two going to think differently? Because you're going to play in this side of the field for the rest of your careers. Innovation managers do a very good job of carrying out somebody else's rules. OK. Whereas entrepreneurs create their own rules. They do. And they're harder rules than any manager can put on you because they're your rules and, and you've got to live with them. That's part of it. Think about if somebody, if Ernie said to you, I want you to go create bump, 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 how would the entrepreneur do it as opposed to a manager? You look like you're capable of doing it, so I'm picking you. What's the difference to the way the manager would approach any project and what the entrepreneur would do? The manager looks at the resources he has at hand and tries to figure out how to make them do the job. The entrepreneur looks at what he thinks he needs to do it and goes and finds it and does it. And doesn't spend money on it. If he can help it. That's right. <laughs> now, there's no money in the beginning of entrepreneurship. There's a lot of sweat equity. You've got to create value to attract money. You rarely have money when you start, unless you happen to be the three guys that start DreamWorks because everybody knew who they were and their background and they had $2 billion at the end of the day without even advertising. So, I mean, there are people that break that mold, but uh, I've seen very few of them in my life. Richard actually started in this business by doing the back of Recycler magazines. I mean, that's where that's great journey that's going to make him a $10 billion a year, a $10 billion IPO within the next year. Managers need resources. You said it. He had the resources. You said correctly the entrepreneur had to go find them. But if you get a project from someone, whether it's a company or a school, you've got to be able to make sure that, A, you got a long runway because it might not get done as fast. An entrepreneur says, it's going to get done when it gets get done because this is something I believe in and I've got the passion for. And so it's re usually uh, alternative resources, big borrow stole researches, anything that could do to be able to allow him to get some kind of traction or her get some kind of traction as we saw inside of the journalist. So the, the biggest single difference is the way that they look at the opportunity. <coughs> the manager, if he fails, what happens? Doesn't get out there on time, doesn't get out there right. What happens to a manager at that point? We have one more empty seat in the room then. That's pretty fatal. That's pretty fatal. It's hard, to, it's hard to mess up an important project and still be around to do it. Entrepreneurs are going to make 20 mistakes on the way there. They know that they're going to do that. It's just not going to be fatal mistakes. And when you get those kinds of things going, you start to, to see. So I want to give you an exercise of entrepreneurial thinking. And I like to do one that's completely away from anything that, I don't know, how many people sail here? Serious sailing. So we've got three of them, okay. 
So this is the story of uh, uh, a young man by the name of David who came to his uncle and said, uh, I, I want to buy this business. I want to be able to start a business. I want your advice. So you are the person he's coming to to talk to to get some advice. And he grew up with a sailing family in Newport Beach. His mother was a world-renowned sailor. And he used to drive on the ferry back and forth from Newport Beach to Balboa. And when cars broke down, getting out the ferry, they called the AAA. One of the great things about entrepreneurship is to recognize a pattern of change and run with it. So the pattern of change going on in 1985 was the Coast Guard was no longer going to use its, its young plebes and, and their ships to be able to help people unless it became a life-threatening. Prior to that, if you lost your, your, uh, your beer can opener, they'd come and help you. But in the new era, you had to be in a life-threatening situation. So he said, gee, what's going to happen to all those people that are out there on their boat that now need real help to be able to get going? So he asked you, should I start this business? That's all you know at this point, yes or no? Yes, sir. Why would you say yes? You don't even know the next slide. He's an guy. Okay, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't be telling this story if it didn't. <laughs> you can tell the journalists, they read right through you. So the question is, how do you vote? Most people would say no, because there's not enough information. You'd be, you'd be teasing yourself if you said you could make it so the question is, you want more information. OK, uh, is this a good idea? How much money is needed to start it? And would you help him? And how do you go about even thinking about this business? These are the basic challenges of starting anything. Entrepreneurial lemonade stands. There is a mindset that keeps on asking this big question. How do I know how to assess this? How do I know whether it's a good or a bad idea? I get hundreds of phone calls. I get hundreds of emails. You got to see my new, my new invention. It is really incredible. And they walk in like this. And I say, so can I see your new invention? No, I can't show it to you. You'll steal it. I promise you I don't want to steal it. But they do. They hide it. They hide it for two reasons. Sometimes failure is going to be embarrassing. It's not going to be an intelligent failure. So people, people are hard to be able to say. One of the great quotes of entrepreneurship in, in a classroom is, uh, don't tell me what you believe. Tell me what you know and why you know it. Because everybody believes they've got the next magic sauce or whatever it is to be able to do it. So how do you start to assess this? How do you do things? How do you vote? And usually you want more information. So we sent him out to do some research. He went out and looked at the research. And he came back with some facts. He felt to be effective, he had to cover from Point Doom all the way down to Baja, 240 miles. The response time of 45 to 60 minutes to be able to get to anyone. One boat for every 10, 12 miles. A boat cost $100,000. And what you're seeing is the mind of a manager. How many resources do I need to be able to, to get started? And nobody would talk to him. Nobody would, nobody would touch it. So we're still saying we don't know what it is yet. But there are underlying things in every industry. If you look for the number one indicator of success in starting an entrepreneurial venture, it is what you have now. It's industry knowledge. I could not walk into here and start even thinking about the projects. It was fun to be a guide to some of the young people that came in, and older people too, into the boot camp last year. But I was only a guide, because I don't know your industry. I haven't struggled in it. I don't have ink under my fingers. I don't, I don't have any of those things. I have them in the industries that I've been able to start successful companies. So there are certain things, patterns of change and recognizing them are the most important. Uh, it's always easier when I'm in an undergrad class, but I'll try anyway. Any surfers in here? Because I always say, I've, I've always watched it. I live out in Calabasas, and I come down the coast every morning, and I watch these supposedly laid-back people, but the most aggressive people I've ever seen. They're in the water. It's dark outside, and they're out there surfing. And I say, so I see, you look like a surfer in the back. No, he's not going to take the hook. Are you a surfer? No, you look like you could have been a surfer. <laughs> could have been a moment of fame. <laughs> So I watch these people, and, and there's like 25 people, and there's three waves coming, and nobody gets on the first one, and a couple of them get on the second one, and then they're fighting to get onto the third. Mm -hmm. And I would say, so how did you know it was the third? And they always come back in a long, different ways all the time, but, well, you have to be in the water to be able to feel it. Well, you have to be in the game to be able to feel it. You're in the game. You've got more going for you right now than any other industry I can think of if you believe that this is truly the opportunity. Because there's no rules. 
You can make the rules. We watched the rules made last year at the camp. In this particular case, there are a number of business things that will take time for you to get through to be able to see, but these other five things, other than the pattern of change, are really critical. First one, direct access to customers, to consumers. And so what you have is the ability to be able to go and find a way to be able to recruit people. You don't have to do it all at once. Is there an existing business model that makes this an easy education? How many people have AAA? Okay, so if I said the AAA or the waterways, would that make it easy for you to understand exactly what it was? So you've got an immediate education, on and on. So we've got those kind of things. Actually, lots of information was needed. I'm watching my time now. And the answer is yes. Not only was that company started, it was started for under $100. It's known as Vessel Assist, the AAA of the waterway. David had it for 18 years. It was all about effectual thinking, and it's now part of Berkshire Hathaway. <laughs> Warren Buffett bought it. And you go, from a kid looking at a pain, what happens when people can't get help with the boat, and you start to see a different mindset. First assignment to every entrepreneur class is find a pain in the next 24 hours and bring in two slides, one defining the pain, and the second one, tell me where the opportunity is. Because if there's a pain, there's an opportunity. I got interviewed by the Financial Times on Wednesday uh, about a story about a worm farm. And I said, okay, I, I don't even want to talk to you. I mean, I, this is going to be an embarrassment of a worm farm in the Financial Times. And he said, well, I'm just trying to figure out why this worked. And he, the, the, the writer talked for about 30 seconds. I said, okay, the, he found a pain. He found out that worms are not only good for fishing, but being able to bring irrigation into the farmlands that were dry. And he now grows millions of worms every year. And I go, good for him. <laughs> <laughs> Do entrepreneurs think differently? If so, how is that? The answer is, it is. This is a long article. I don't want to go through it. There's other things I want to show you. But what it is, is Sarah Servathi did the research. She's probably one of three researchers in the field of entrepreneurship that I believe in. And what she really came up with is there are very distinct differences in the way people think. And, and the essence of it is the difference between effectual. And, and I'm, not, I'm not going through it. Let me, let me rush. I'm sorry for this. I don't want to little stuff that was out there. Managerial thinking, easy creative thinking, we can argue about. Uh, but what she came down to was an example. <coughs> and that's strategic. Okay, so she said everybody's looking for the same thing, a customer. There's two different ways to be able to do it. If you are a classic marketeer, you need a lot of resources. My daughter, a graduate of the, uh, the school, uh, the Annenberg School, who is a marketing genius, is spending $50 million to introduce a new consumer product for a national firm. $50 million. I told her if she could share that $50 million with me, I think we could buy California. <laughs> <laughs> what the magic sauce is for the existing causation model of marketing and the things that people think about when they start thinking about entrepreneurship is lots of money spent on each one of those steps. The entrepreneur is looking for the same customer but they're going to find low cost or no cost ways to be able to get there. So the causation model really says that if you're introducing a new product, and this is old, $11.5 million. And if you take the other models, they come here, but I want to show you what the entrepreneur does. I'm sorry, I went back too far. So the entrepreneur, using industry knowledge, you, using patterns of change, you, skill sets, your writing and in, in investigation capabilities, the social networks that you have, and using different tools, you can get to a customer in hand. And if you have a customer in hand, you have a business. And for $19.61, that's what it cost me to start my last company. It took us seven years to get it built, sold, and uh, I probably should have spent 30 bucks and doubled the price at the end, but <laughs> I'm trying to show you that you have more of the characteristics in your little finger than most people have. So I don't want to go down this one. This is her final. Model. I want to take you to a couple of other places because there is a word challenge that we have. And it's a big word challenge. Okay, the battle of definitions. Uh, innovation. <laughs> introducing something new. Uh, you can introduce something new. You can now have the newspaper with red paper and white ink. That's innovation. But it's not going to stick because it's not driven by a business model. Without the business model, I have challenge. And there's a lot of great innovators on this campus. And they're constantly changing things to make them new. And I love it, but I don't see any of these 
giving the, getting the, the, the legs to be able to run the long distance. To create is to bring change. But if you don't know where that change is being directed, who the people are going to pay to make this change, that doesn't do anything. The entrepreneur is the one who assumes the risk of business. I think that's a great misnomer. I never knew an entrepreneur that succeeded that was a risk taker. I've always known entrepreneurs who were very, very good risk managers. And you don't have to rush it. Risk management wins every day. Ours is this efficacy thing that came out of that Saris article, is to be able to imagine the ends and create the means. It gives you a starting point. OK, let me go past this. Intelligent failure. Some people argue with me that it doesn't exist. Some of the great people of all time. I know that he left us and we hate him because of it. <laughs> But look who says his success came from intelligent failures. Pete Carroll. Pete Carroll says, if I didn't fail those early times, I wouldn't have made it to where I am today. So a whole different thing. The hardest part I find for people when they first look at this is there's nothing in their mindset that gives them a structure. I'm sure when you hear a news article, something happens in your brain and it puts it into some kind of position and you start trading those things off each other. We are one of the few schools in the country that don't believe in the business plan. Why? My guess is I've read 30,000 business plans over the last 30 years. I've never read one that said I was going to fail in the third month. <laughs> but 50% of them do. 90% of them fail in the first year. Why would I want to even think that way, which is a model of I have an idea, how do I get money off the dean to go do it? That, that, it's never been successful. In our case, what we do is that we let the market define the opportunity. What the campers are working on right now on a distance learning course is concept definition. If I can articulate what it is I'm trying to do in 30 seconds, it's called the elevator pitch, I'm going to be able to have something that I can put down that filter and, and the market's going to tell me what it doesn't want. And I might have 100 ideas up there and get three to the bottom, but those three are the three that I might start looking at an execution plan. So this is called feasibility and it's this constant recirculization of things going through. Articulation of a customer, a means of reaching a customer, and then delivering that benefit. So both in the online class and in person, people are saying, OK, I've got an idea. I can articulate it in 30 seconds. I can come up with every possible customer. And our definition of customer is the one that writes you a check. So it has to be a person that's writing a check. The consumer is something different. The customer is the check writer. How many different ways to reach them? And I never liked the word, what is the product or what is the feature? What people buy are benefits. There's a great article on entrepreneurship that came out in the Wall Street Journal 10 years ago. I still got it stuck on a bulletin board. It basically says nobody ever bought a quarter inch drill. They bought a quarter inch hole exactly where they wanted it in the wall. It's a benefit thought. So what your mind should be saying is there's things that I have redefined as I just start thinking about this. The benefit is not the print that you do. The benefit is what the information is that got to them. That's what they're buying. So if we start looking at this, we now can start structuring models. If I know what the concept is up top, if I know who the benefit of the customer is, I start thinking about money for the first time, and I start thinking of it in the terms of a business model. What do I need to be able to turn this thing and get this spinning in a direction? The actual transaction that creates it. And again, I was impressed by half a dozen of last year's people that did it. So how it works is, is that way. Uh, one of the things we've worked on hard, our first distance learning course was with your own Rebecca Weintraub. We, uh, we were in business for four and a half years as the Center for Distance Learning on campus. The plug got pulled when uh, various people changed positions. Uh, I'm hoping that this becomes an important part of, of what the university is about. Oh, I'm sorry. Are they going to give me questions? I hope so. Uh, what we really, what, I, what I'm doing, uh, I've stepped down as director of the entrepreneur program. I've spent all of my energy for the last two years on what I'm calling the Entrepreneur Institute. And the Entrepreneur Institute is the education so that this model can be placed in every single school that would like to have it as an advantage. So here's the assignment if you were part of my class. Somewhere in the next 24 hours, identify a pain. Tell me what the opportunity is. Have the courage to send me an email. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like I just gave you a drink out of a fire hose. I mean, just. We're, we're in a 
different communication school. We're used to that. <laughs> okay. We're thrilled that you identified it as so full of pain that the opportunities are endless. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, so, okay, look, somebody in the room must have something they're trying to do that's not working, it's not working well. So it is a pain. I mean, what, what's the problem that in journalism or communication? Okay. Well, communicators? We need you in smaller classrooms. Mm, there's one in the back there. Um, He's high. The fact that somebody might have brought them in doesn't mean you shouldn't use them because your questions might be more in line with what they're thinking of. The role of entrepreneurship is that your mother was wrong, you have to talk to a lot of strangers. You have to talk to people you don't know that know something that you need to know. And that means that you start conversations. And, and it's a conversation of high energy because you're saying, I'm looking for some people that could do this. And they go, well, I have a friend that does that, and I have somebody over there, and okay, why don't we get together for lunch tomorrow and see, if, and wonderful magical things come out of bright minds not being afraid to sound stupid on some parts and sound very bright in other parts. Can I build on that just a second, what the gentleman said is that um, we tend to think of entrepreneurship in the private sector and starting firms. A lot of our students are also interested in nonprofits and non-governmental organizations. So I wonder, Tom, if you could say something about the transferability of your model from a commercial sector into something that's more nonprofit. Okay. Uh, it actually happened last year, Ernie. We, we opened using a, uh, a really successful uh, person inside of the industry, Adlai Wertman, a social entrepreneurship program. And the stories that have come out of there already have been amazing. And, and so the same mind thinking, I'll give you one example. Uh, the example that, that, and this is Wertman's story, and he would tell that better to you, but uh, we do offer classes in social entrepreneurship. He was, he was a uh, Wharton person, an MBA, worked Wall Street, got tired of the, the planes and everything else, and decided he was going to pick his family up, move to California, and ran Chrysalis, a home for, uh, for, for homeless people, and did a tremendous job with it. But he started to get involved with the bigger picture of it, not just the good deed, but the great action. And the one, that, the one that he said the first time that I was interviewing him and resonates to this day, he said, uh, he said pharmaceutical companies are willing to help wherever they can. If they've got a, a pile of drugs that have got three months left on an expiration, they'll do anything they can to help, and they'll send it to Africa or wherever it is that might be able to help. Well, by the time it got there and the cost to get it there was worth more than the pills ever could be. So they were looking for an alternative way of thinking. Back to that channel line, a different channel. And the channel they came up with was when they had a part of their team was in Africa, they saw a Coca-Cola truck stop and deliver four cases of Coca-Cola. So they went back to Coca-Cola and they said, would you like to do something that can really change the world? Would you allow us to put a two foot by two foot, one high foot high, filled with pharmaceuticals that are going to expire in the next 90 days that cost you nothing, and have your trucks just drop them off? And they've been doing that for the last four years. So, and, and it's that thinking. It's, it's, and it, is it outside the box? No, it's really very structured and very disciplined, but you change the channel. There's always one part of those three things that change that gives you what you have as an outcome. Uh, we'll t and after this, we'll take one more, and then we do have we to stop. Have a student. You have a student here also? Okay. <laughs> Tom, would you see to the student, and then we'll go to the professor. Okay. Um, you stress the importance of knowing the I, I don't, I've, I've raised three daughters and we've had the same conversation for years. Uh, I don't know that anybody at your age knows what they want to be. 
I think as you go through that journey, you start to see that thing by itself. So the answer is, it doesn't matter what you get paid as long as you got rent and food. Mm -hmm. Seriously, just keep on doing the things until it shows you where your real excitement and your real talent is. It's, it's no longer formulaic. The world's, I mean, get to some of the campers that we've gotten offered to be their intern. Just hit the ground running. Yeah. Yeah. Which is the cornerstone of a lot of the policy making literature about how governments should proceed to analyze these various social problems. And it's taught in this school and a lot of the argumentation and critical thinking courses. Good. So it's a terrific. You know, it's good to hear those two disciplines coming to the same point. Well, I, I think that uh, we, we really, this is in some ways an innovation. It's a conversation uh, between two silos. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, John Seely Brown and others say that innovation occurs at the edges. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so here we see two edges coming together, and I think we're innovating. And uh, I know many of you in the audience come from a variety of different backgrounds, private sector, public sector, the academy, and so I hope you will continue to bring your edges together so we can continue to have this, uh, this conversation in the future. So I want to thank all of you for coming, and I especially want to thank Tom. My pleasure. Absolute pleasure.